Let's talk about Senjutsu, Battle for Japan, the perfect game to play between episodes of Shogun. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about a miniatures battling card-based action game set in Japan called Senjutsu Battle for Japan. Now, this is a game that was sent to me not too long ago by the designer Paul Allen, uh, and it's, it, it comes from Stone Sword Games, and Lucky Duck, I think, is the distributor uh, in North America. This is a game for between one and four players. It's definitely complicated enough that you're going to be playing it with teenagers, so 14 and up is the age recommendation here. But games can play, once you're familiar with the rules, games can play in only about 20 minutes. Let's take a deeper look at Senjutsu Battle for Japan from Stone Sword Games. Like I said, Senjutsu is a miniatures battling game where you're using cards in order to take your actions. There's The maps are very small, so you're playing between one and four players, but you're crowded together on a small map, which is good. You don't want to waste time chasing down your opponents. There are multiple maps uh, in the game and you can put them together like a puzzle and, and play on more than one map. And in fact, they're double-sided too. So you can mix and match a little bit with kind of a modular board. Senjutsu is medium in terms of its complexity. There's lots of, once you get used to the rules, it becomes simpler, but there are lots of rules to figure out and the rule book is quite thick. Uh, the solo campaign also, there's a big spiral bound solo campaign rule book uh, as well. So we're talking about a medium weight, I think kind of a game, maybe on the light end of medium, but let's call it medium weight. What you're trying to do in this game is to be the player who defeats all of the opponents on the table. Now you might play in teams of two, but you're trying to be the team or the individual that's the last man standing. How do you do that? Well, you're going to be battling using cards and you'll knock out another player if you give them wounds that are equal to their wound limit or higher, or if they wind up with a handful of stun cards, meaning that they're knocked unconscious and they can't continue to fight. I've moved my camera angle a little bit here because I thought it would be more interesting for you to see the board from kind of an isometric angle as opposed to it being top down. There are in the box that I received uh, some scenery pieces that are miniatures but they also have flat cardboard versions of these pieces as well. So if you want to keep the board flat and just have your samurai battling you can do that. Uh, this is a flaming wagon. It takes up two hexes on the board. You've got bamboo pieces. There are boulders. There are um, all kinds of things that you can add to, to this little map. But it is a small map, so it does add kind of to the strategy that you might have to use in terms of placing your pieces. Uh, but you're kind of choosing which pieces you want to add to the board at the start of the game. Now, because we are talking about a game where you're battling with miniatures on a little map and you're doing that by playing cards from a deck. I, I think that Senjutsu is a game that's going to be compared to other miniatures card-based battling games such as Unmatched, which is on the shelf here behind me, but it is quite different in many ways from Unmatched. Let's talk about those differences. Before you start the game uh, of Unmatched, you're going to have to build your deck. So these decks, you can create pre-constructed decks based on recommendations in the rule book, but you are custom. You can customize how you're going to play this game. You're even choosing your samurai's weapon before you start the game. So uh, it, it is kind of an interesting difference here that once you know the rules and understand what all the cards do, what your characters are going to do on the board, then you're, you're going to be able to adjust things to fit whatever play style you want to fit. And each of these characters plays quite differently. There's a warrior, a ronin, a master. I've pulled out the master deck here. And a student. What I've done, honestly, is I made the pre-constructed decks before my friends came over. And then we played the game with the pre-constructed decks. I kept those together. So I didn't customize things very much. But the reason for that is that I'm always teaching new people how to play these games. So uh, you, you really need to know the game before you start trying to make your own deck in order to play. Another interesting quirk of the game is based on the character you choose, you're going to have a couple of core cards that will stay in your hand 
throughout the game. So you can play these cards as actions, but rather than discarding them at the end of your turn like you would any other kind of a card, these ones come back into your hand and and the cards your core cards are dictated by the character you've chosen so that's you're going to have a core weapon card and you get to choose that weapon there are a few options here that you might be able to see on the bottom of the ronin uh, th this card also tells you by default what your advantage level is like in in the event of a tie for initiative who's going to go first the ronin wears heavy armor and he moves quite slowly compared to the master or the student or the warrior you've got your hand limit you've got your wound limit on here as well so your character card is going to dictate certain things uh, but chief among them is the main cards the core cards they're called they're called that you're going to have in your hand throughout the game so players are going to know every turn there are a couple of options that you're going to be able to do they'll know for example that that ronin does have this long weapon with the pole on it called a naganata and that's a, a weapon that can attack from a distance you'll have once the the warriors have i say warriors one of the characters is a warrior once all of the players have played those core cards a couple of times hopefully you're going to be able to remember what that default option is so that you can place your figure accordingly another difference between senjutsu and other miniatures battling games is that the facing of your miniature is very important. So some of your movement cards are going to be used to turn your character so they're facing in the right direction so that they can attack the other players. You may, I'm not sure, but you may be able to see on the camera that there's a little arrow that points forward on each of these figures to tell you which direction they're facing. And when you play an attack card, let me see if I can find the attack card, the attack cards are going to indicate which hexes you're affecting based on which way your character is facing. You're going to start each turn of this game by drawing a card. So you're going to have your two core cards in your hand, and then otherwise there's a five card limit. So you'll have a total of six cards plus your two extra ones. Then you're going to play one of those cards face down in front of you. That's the action that you want to take, but all of the players are playing them face down. You don't know what anyone else is going to do until everyone reveals their card. Now, there are numbers at the top of these cards that indicate how quickly the action might take place. So a seven is going to be a faster action. In the event of a tie, the character with the faster character card who has the advantage is typically going to be the one who wins. That's the 74 here at the top of the master. He is a very quick one. He just about always won initiative when he wanted to in this game. So you'll play that card face down and then everyone reveals them simultaneously there are some replacement cards some kind of instant reaction cards or cards that can add to your action once the cards have been played and you see everyone else's actions but typically you're going to be playing that single card and then flipping it over my poor ronin was always the slowest i usually picked the ronin and i liked him because he could attack at a distance he had some fun cards well cards that i thought were fun uh, and he had that long weapon that he could sweep across a couple of hexes that were two spaces away from him but he always moved slowly so i was almost always the last one to go on my turn but that heavy armor was helpful because it could protect me from damage so this is the heavy armor card and i can use this to add to an action it stays on the table so my armor will allow me to reduce wounds by one but I have to take a hobble card, which slows me down even further. So there, there are hobble cards, there are wound cards, there are stun cards. There's so many stacks of cards that you're going to be using when you're playing this game. So the facing is important and the simultaneous reveal is important. And so I might be trying to, with my slow, heavy weapon, trying to attack a, another character who's in a space over here. But by the time my attack happens, he might have turned and moved to an entirely different space and my attack will miss. There are no dice to roll. If I play a card and a character is in that space, that attack is going to take place. Now, there are some defensive cards in the deck. And like I said, I had heavy armor when I was playing as the Ronin. So that allowed me to protect myself to an extent. Some cards have multiple actions that you can do or bonus actions, depending on whether you can pay the cost. And you've, you're going to start the game with a, I don't know if I picked the right ring here, but you've got a stance card with a ring on it, and you might be standing in a defensive stance or in a more aggressive stance, and that's going to have an impact on the actions that the cards will allow you to take. Uh, eventually, you might 
move the ring up here where you've got that little flower. That's a focus token that you're going to get. And some of the cards have a focus token cost or they could do an extra action if you pay a token. This is a complicated game to explain. And in fact, the rule book was quite intimidating and complicated to figure out. Uh, but as I said, once you start to play and you've played through a few rounds, most of these rules become pretty clear. So you're revealing those cards, you're paying the cost, you're deciding if you want to replace them, and then the actions are going to get resolved in order of initiative, that from highest number in the top left corner of the card to lowest, and then you're going to discard those cards and get ready for the next turn. There are a limited number of cards in the deck, and it doesn't take long before you start to run low, I'll be honest with you. And so because you're drawing a card at the beginning of each turn, you can't just sit in the back and wait and see what happens, because your, your deck is going to deplete, and you're going to be playing cards and, and discarding them every round. If you have to draw a card and you have no cards left to draw, you're going to instead draw a wound card. That's going to sit face up in front of you, at the table and once your wound cards that you've gathered have reached your wound limit five in the case i think of all the characters in in the base game that i have once you get those five wounds it's game over for you and you're finished so that does keep the game moving and it forces some maybe more aggressive play you can't just turtle in the corner and wait and see so you'll get defeated if your wound card reaches your wound limit. Some of the actions, and, and the Ronin had some of these, he could do a horse kick or a pommel strike in, in the base deck that I had built, the pre-constructed deck. So that would stun another character, which forces them to take a stun card into their hand. This takes up space in the hand limit. It can't be discarded. You have to play it as your action. It does nothing as an action because you're stunned, but if you have all of your all of your hand is taken up by these cards, you are going to be out of the game because you're unconscious. So you are going to sometimes play a card that that means you're taking no action. Hopefully you'll be able to bluff the other player so they won't, they won't know what you're going to do. There are poison cards, there are bleeding wounds that force you to discard extra cards, and, and so the players are going to get eliminated in, in short order, I would say, as you play through the game. It is thought of as a 20-minute game. It certainly took us longer in the first few games that we played because there's so much to think about. I would say 20 minutes is, is maybe an underestimate for, for most of these games. But one of the players is going to be eliminated, and then the last two are going to finish off their duel, and then the last man standing is going to be the winner of this game. And that is Senjutsu in a nutshell. What skills, though, are you working on when you play a game like Senjutsu? Well, this is a game where the, there, there is a heavy visual-spatial reasoning involvement here. You're looking at the map and where everyone is. You maybe are trying to predict where other players might move so that you're attacking in the right space and you're moving about this board. Even understanding the hexes where your actions are going to have an impact involves some visual spatial translation from the picture on the card based on the facing of your character. There's mental rotation involved because my character is facing this way or the other way and my card is showing this is what it looks like from the, the front of the character. The Ronin, in fact, had a lot of cards that would allow him to move backwards because he wants to get away from these players that are attacking him because his attacks tend to take place at a distance. So some of those movements were backwards and it took certainly took me a minute. My spatial skills aren't the strongest, maybe. It took me a minute to kind of grasp, okay, which way is this guy moving when I play this card? And sometimes I made a mistake. I thought I was going to move forward, but the card said, no, you got to go back. Of course, when you're budgeting cards and actions and you're planning ahead and you're trying to predict what's going to happen next, you are invoking the executive functioning skills, those behaviors and skills that you need to work towards a goal. And your goal in this case, well, your short-term goal is maybe a successful attack on your other players or a successful block. Your long-term goal, of course, is to knock those other players out of the game. So you you do need to do a little bit of at least short-term planning, but you're also budgeting those cards and you have to be careful over the long term that you don't run out of cards and wind up having to draw wounds without being able to do anything else. Memory is a factor here too. And, and I'm going to say this is a game that places heavy demands on working memory skills. Working memory is the whiteboard in your mind where you keep information in order to manipulate it or work with it somehow. It's important for multitasking and you have to consider so many things 
when you're playing this game. Not just where the characters are and where they're going to move, not just where the terrain is, but your card effects are going to change based on your stance. Your facing is going to affect where actions are going to take place. You're thinking about the speed of your action. You may need to think about replacing cards. There might be multiple options for actions on your card that you have to decide upon. There's a lot of information to juggle. It's it's not it's not as straightforward maybe as some other uh, battling games where it's like, okay, I know what I can do on my turn. I'm going to play this card. All the other characters are where they are. I'm going to play this card and I know what's going to happen. There's so many things to consider here. And as I said, based on your your stance, the, the impact of those cards that you play is going to be different. And you might be trying to earn focus in order to play some cards. The poor Ronan was the least focused, I think, of the characters that we played. It was usually hard for me to earn those focus uh, cards. So I wound up discarding cards that cost focus because my, my character was not very focused in the game that he played. He was just aggressive all the time. So there's a lot to keep track of in this game and it does place those demands on working memory skills. Final thoughts though about Senjutsu Battle for Japan. Well well, this is a game, look, the theme, I, I, I love Japanese history. I just found it fascinating all the way since I was in high school. I remember the first time I read those Shogun novels and now the TV show's on. So it is, the timing is great for a game like this because now I'm thinking about that period in Japanese history because I'm watching that show, you know, Blue Eye Samurai, which is not a show for kids, definitely. I would say neither is Shogun. Uh, these are, are shows for grown-ups, but uh, they are shows that focus on that period of time in history uh, where you've got these amazing armor on the samurai. You've got these weapons that are... I'll tell you what happened when we played this game. So we played it at a three-player count. Uh, with the same people every time uh, and my nephew who's a teenager as we're building the decks and he's choosing his weapons he's googling on his phone to find pictures of the weapons and he's telling us oh my gosh this thing was six feet long it's almost as tall as the person who's holding it and he was just he was fascinated too but he didn't know a thing about samurai or ronin or or an anything about japanese history really uh but he I can't think of the last time where a game had such an evocative theme that a teenager is doing historical research as we're playing the game. He's looking at, at why these cards work the way that they do, and he's translating some of the language uh, on the cards. To me, that is amazing if you can play a game that does that and get a teenager, you know, hooked in that way and thinking about a period in history. I just think that that is a, a, a fantastic part. Uh, and, and the theme is fascinating. The components are great. You've got all of these miniatures that you can use. Alternatively, you can choose to keep everything flat just so that your own minis stand out. Uh, the, the terrain has an impact on gameplay and is going to do certain things if your characters bump into it. It's not just something that you have to walk around. It's a game where you've got characters whose, whose weapons and actions that they can take and, and their their cards that dictate the stance really is really asymmetric and they do feel different when you play them so that's a, another interesting factor here as well um so i really really enjoyed this game i just thought everything about it was fascinating and the fact that it's kind of gritty in terms of uh, not knowing what where the other players are going to be when you do your attack uh, and having to adjust your stance for attack or defense um, just so many things about this game I found kind of crunchy and fascinating. The fact that running out of cards is going to cause you to take wounds instead, you know, that keeps things moving too. You can be a little defensive, but you can't sit back for very long in this game. So, I, you know, this is a game that I, I, I really, really enjoyed, as I said. But there are some downsides. Uh, and one downside is, you know, for me, player elimination is a big issue. You know, I don't want to be sitting or I don't want, you know, my guests to be sitting and waiting for a game to end so that they can join in again. That's something that for me it, in many games is a deal breaker. That This is why I think that Senjutsu is a game that's going to play best at my house at least at a two player count so that, you know, the game is over when one player is eliminated and then you can play again. 
I prefer games like that, and I, I haven't really thought, are there house rules that we could use? I haven't thought about that in too much depth. I think a two-player count is going to be really good. But honestly, like there wasn't that much time between one player getting eliminated and then the game ending at a three-player count either. So your mileage may vary on that one. I mentioned the working memory demands in the skill section of the video, and there are a lot of demands here that we're talking about. Um, you know, sometimes it was overwhelming the number of options and things that you could do and you did you might get a little bit paralyzed it is a game that does you know you need to have a big whiteboard in your mind to keep everything straight so it is a game that does require that there's a lot of concentration and memory involvement here uh, and it places high demands on those skills and those are going to be I mean they're good skills for you to practice but you need to maybe have a certain baseline before you can really get into a game like Sinjutsu because there's so much to keep track of and there's multiple things even on a single card that you have to make some choices about Deck construction and card organization is, is an upside and a downside. There are pros and cons to that. One is that um, it, you can customize your deck for your gameplay style, and I think it's cool to have that as an option. The other is that it does take time at the beginning of a game to do that, and then you have to put all the cards back in the right places afterwards. So as I said, I just left the pre-constructed decks together in their stack in the box so that they were easy to pull out and I could play the game again. Um, but if if I were trying to customize things, that's going to add, I mean, it's 20 minutes of play time, but it might be half an hour of organizing cards before and after the game. There's nothing, there are spots to put the cards in the box. It's not, there is an insert in the box, which really is is good at organizing the miniatures and the cardboard pieces there are some cardboard figures when you're playing the solo game um, but it's just places for stacks of cards there's no organizers or tabs or anything like that and that's something that i think um, might prevent the game from coming to the table in some homes as often as it would otherwise uh, another example of a card game with deck construction and poor organization would be Marvel Champions. I think that game is really cool, but you know, I haven't played it since I made the video because you've got to organize all of those cards and it's such a pain, I find, because you can't find everything. There's not even an official tab that you can put in. You've got to buy something on Etsy in order to organize your cards for that game. So um, this is one where the cards are stacked up. I can't remember if the box has three or four different stacks. So you can divide things up a little bit. You know, I kept the wound cards and the stun cards and the crippling poison and the hobble cards all together. Uh, and, and as I said, I stacked up the pre-constructed deck but there's not a good organizer in there and that's a bit uh, a, a bit of an issue now as I said I still like this game I don't want to I don't want to knock it too much because I just think it, so many things about it are fascinating and fun um, the rule book is intimidating because there are so many card options and so many things to think about and timing and facing of your characters is important uh, and you've got there, there are rules for deck building wow uh, you know it's an intimidating rule book and it's, there is a table of contents, which many rule books lack, but it's not the best organized rule book either. You know, as you're reading through it, there's a picture in the middle of a sentence when really it should have maybe been in between paragraphs or at the end of a sentence. You know, have a figure and, and indicate what that figure is. You know, that's typically how a rule book would be done. That's not the way that Senjutsu is, at least in the, in the copy of the rule book that I have. There may be some updates online to that. I'm not sure. So the formatting and the organization of the rule book sometimes made things more intimidating. And every so often, rarely, I'll be honest with you but every so often there would be a judgment call what do I do in this situation that being said uh, I think the theme here is amazing the components are great the small map the quick gameplay once you get used to it uh, there's so many positives about this game I think this is a special one so thanks so much to Paul Allen and Stone Sword Games for sending Senjutsu my way honestly I'm, I'm looking at the pieces here and I can't wait to play it again so thanks again for sending this game my way if you have any questions or comments you can leave them in the comment section below the video or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca brainsongames.ca is the website that's where future episodes will go previous ones are up there already brains on games is the x handle and the facebook page and the instagram feed so we're all over the place and if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones 
you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thank you.